to continue to move forward. It's our final day. We're going to give away a short block a little bit later. But right now, this is an area where I think everybody is very interested. People who assemble engines, the tick the tips, the tricks, the way, the shortcuts, the way to do it the right way. And uh, you got a lot to do with this next one. Oh, so like I said, imagination and tools. This is the video, John Kazi, the master idea guy, master tool maker. Take it away, John. I'm John Kazi and uh, I'm in Winder, Georgia at John Kazi Racing. What we're gonna talk about today is some tools that will help you that uh, will either save you time, save you money, save you a lot of grief, and the stuff that's taken me 50 years to figure out. So there's nothing that's going to be real expensive. It's all stuff that you can do homemade or buy, but it'll be uh, something you, when you get done watching this, you're going to have something that you can take away from this and it will help you. And uh, anyway, the first thing we're going to talk about is years ago, I came up with a problem where when you're working with a bridge port, any kind of mill, you know, and you got your key nuts and all that stuff, they always jam up when you tighten them and then you can't get them loose through your pans and, you know, you you can double nut them and get them out, but I finally decided I'm going to do something different. So we, we started this about 20 years ago, but what we do is we make a, a tool that's a, like a split nut. And nobody builds them, so you have to make them yourself, but they clamp on and it does not hurt the threads any. It's just absolutely perfect for what we use them for. So after doing the bridge port one, uh, well, you know what? That's going to work good for main studs. You know? so we, we built some other ones and there's half inch, you know, half inch fine. Most of them end up being fine thread, but, uh, but the one we use the most, and we've used this for probably a good 15 years, is this one here that's a quarter 28. It's all homemade. It's got about a, oh, about a five inch diameter piece of bar stock that was drilled and tapped in the lathe. And then when you get all done, you put it in the bike strips, weld it together, and put it in a bandsaw or a this wheel where it cut it in half. Deburr a little bit, and this is the most, one of the most used tools in our shop. And we have some stuff that, like a lot of these cylinder heads will have valve cover studs on the end. Well, every time you put them in a head machine, like a survey to, to work with them, you gotta pull the studs out, you know? So anyway, we'll, we'll do this and it just it's, it's works perfectly. Now this one, like I said, is probably 15, 20 years old. It still works. It, it never ever touches the first threads. It just it works flawlessly. Um, the one thing I would say, if, you, if you're going to make your own, like this one here is for 516s, and I used the union nut on it. Union nut's not quite strong enough. It'll work, but it's not as good. It, it's better if you make a piece like the bar stock, drill it and tap it either in a, in a drill press or lathe or whatever, and, and then put it in a weld it. And, and cut it in half. But the bigger it is, the stronger it is, the, the, the more distance it'll have for the threads and the better it will work. You know, what I found is where I used the uh, the split nuts, uh, just because I didn't feel like doing the lathe work that day, the split nut ones don't work near as good. But any of the ones you use, like a, if you do Chevy head studs, the 7 you know, uh, main studs, half inch course for the bridge port, it, these things don't take half hour to make, and I just I just love them. So I, I thought I'd start out with that. Um, on the the bridge part ones, this is a union nut that comes in those clamp kits for all your clamps and stuff. So you just grab one of those. Okay. What I wanted to talk about was some lifters, and this is some things that we've run into a problem over the years. That uh, and it really it's our way of measuring things. But what happens is. You know, with an iron block, especially and a steel lifter, that you better have enough clearance. And so, and what we'll do, you know, we'll get here. Okay, you make this lifter here, and it's eight seventy four, and eight seventy four, it's eight seventy four, and everywhere. So, what we found happens on some lifters, uh, not all, but some, they're actually not real round. It's like they're almost like three sided, like a three lobe. So when you measure it, the, the, the mic is on a low spot, a high spot, it measures 874, but it, we really couldn't measure it good. So what we ended up doing is 
And this isn't that hard. It takes you a little bit of a while, but you know, we've got a piece of steel that we bored a bunch of holes in and we honed it to all different sizes. So it goes from 875 to 873 every half thou. And what we found was we might make a lifter that makes 874 everywhere, and we put it in the 874 hole where well, it's not going. You know, it gets tight. So it might go in the 875 hole or 874 and a half hole, but it's tight. So what does that mean? It means it's probably not real round, but you better go by the size of the hole, not by what the micrometer says. So we end up, we, we kind of check and see what size these lifters are. Uh, like this is, okay, this one, it'll go in an 874 hole, so we're going to call it 874. It needs about one and three quarters out players. And so what we end up doing, we'll use a board gauge when we're honing them, but this is a, a pin that's it's about one and a half thousand bigger than 874 and a half, so it's 876 something. And we this thing better fit in that block. You know, so you can board gauge that thing all you want, but it doesn't mean the hole's perfect around either. But but you have to go by the size that it fits in this hole and the size of the pin, and it better work. And if it doesn't go, it could lie to you by half a three quarter of a thou, possibly even more. And the, the problem is, you can have a thousand clearance with lifters, and it's going to go in, but it's not going to live. It'll it'll seize up right away. So it's like my one guy Ron Baker who works here. He says. If it's a little bit loose, nobody will know. If it's a little bit tight, everybody knows. Because it blows up. So uh, we uh, are very good about making sure that these things have enough clearance. And but the, the big thing is how you measure it. So this this has really helped us measure the lifter, make sure everything works right, and it's got at least you know one and three quarters of that clearance. And we've also found too that if you have more valve spring, it's more crucial because the more valve spring it has, the more side load it has on the lifter. And what you might get by with with a hydraulic, you won't get by with seven or eight hundred pounds open. You know, it'll seize up. So, and it'll happen on a new one. It'll happen on a used one. But th this will fix, fix most of your problems. Okay, this is a tool that uh, it's actually an old Chrysler Hemi tool. I got the idea from Barnett Automotive, where I used to rent space. Um, so I basically I sold it from them. But, um, this is stuff they used on a lot of hemis, but it's a spark plug welded on a tube, you know, hollowed out steel plug. Uh, this little part here is homemade, two inch indicator, but it's just for checking PVC with a hand and a cell. And, um, you know, over the years, we use this a lot on everything. We use it if, if we're in the dyno room and we're worried that maybe the balance here is. Something happened and the TDC is not right. I've actually seen sheared T waves. I've seen balancers break and I've seen wheels move. And we put this in and double check the TDC. But it'll it'll even work on a wedge. But it's something you can make. It take you a little bit of time, but you need some adjustment up here. And uh, we have the little nut here, just the height where it stops, and this slides up and down on here. It uh, it just screws in. And uh, sometimes we don't even screw it in, we just lay it in the hole. Just like, especially if it had like a 12 millimeter plug instead of 14 or something. But it's an awesome, awesome tool. Okay, this little tool here is about 25, 30 years old. I've been using it all the time on heads when you're looking at porting and push rod holes and stuff like that. But what it's for is that uh, we get in there and check the, th the thickness of this push rod tube here. And uh, it's homemade. It starts out like this. It's the inside down caliper. And um, what we did, we cut the legs off about right here and bend some aluminum around. Hose clamp it. It's very high tech. The hose clamp it to the legs. Now, one thing that will happen is because it's farther from center now, the, the numbers that show up here aren't about two, they're about two to one. So if it says, uh, 30 thousandths here, it actually is 60, but it's easy to measure. But what we do is, you know, we, we put it in here, put it in the push rod tube hole, and you go like this, and you look at it and say, okay, well, it measures, you know, it measures 70 or something right there. Okay, there's a fence about Then you come around and you look at it and say what it, what it really is. But, uh, and then at times, if you're pointing on the head, we'll put a little Prussian blue on this part right here. And get in there, and when you go up and down where the thinnest spot is, it leaves you a little pasty blue line there. And you know, okay, I'm at the thinnest I want to be. I'm going to stay away from that. You know, 
But what we see is I'd like to see about 60 thousandths here on these holes. And, and on this gauge, that's a, actually about 30 is the thinnest number I want to see. And there's times when we have to weld stuff up and it just, it, it removes all doubt. And it's very easy to make. Um, I looked and you can buy used ones or pretty decent ones on eBay for about a hundred bucks. This one here was MSC, I bought it new, I think it's, and I'm about ready to replace it because this one's got 30 years of wiggle in it. But uh, um, anyway, you can, you can make it for about a hundred dollars if you're a smart shopper. And you'll have it for years and it'll save you a lot of grief. But, and I can tell you, on an iron head or something like that, and you're grinding the scratch run, you do not want to pour through that thing. Okay, this is what we call it. We call it the crab. But um, it's one of those deals, you spent 30 minutes making it 30 years ago, I figure we'll make a good one next week, but we're still using it. But whatever the distance is here, the distance is here. It's 50-50. So if it's, if it's 100 thick here, it's 100 thick here. Where, where you use that in places that you can't get some of those other pieces, but we especially use this where the spring seat would be, right here. Because, you know, there's times when you cut for springs or something, you get in there and all of a sudden, you know, you pop through. Well, how do you know how thick that spring seat is to the head? Okay, so you just look here. That's how thick it is. Or up here, or anywhere you're pouring. But it's very easy to make um, a couple pieces of aluminum rod or steel rod or whatever, and figure out a way to put a swivel in it. If they're big enough, you could probably just drill a hole through them and make a hex out of it. But quick, uh, save you a lot of trouble. Well, let's talk about cam bearings for a minute because uh, anybody that's ever built motors, I'm going to tell you, they've had trouble with cam bearings. And um, so there's some things that will help you and it'll get you out of a real bind that I'm going to show you. Uh, you know, this started out to be one of those kits that had an adjustable thing on the end. You pretty much can throw those things in the trash, but uh, they have to be the exact right size and brand new to work right. So pretty much, you know, you, you're going to have to make installers and we make them out of aluminum and uh, but if you have a roller cam bearing like this you really need to make them anyway because it needs to be thicker have a bigger shelf on here to, to help push that in if you use a little skinny one like this one on a roller bearing it might break part of the race it's not so good but uh, unfortunately you know on a small Ford or something you gotta make five because there's all different sizes but but uh, pretty much if you're going to work on motors you better get a bit of lathe work anyway you're not going to make it if you don't have a plate. But, um, but, but, but the big thing that I wanted to show you was there's times where we lack a cam bearing in. Something will happen even though you did your best and it's got a tight spot. You know, and usually it's toward the beginning where you knocked it in. Like the edge here took a little bit of the bad and it pushed it in a little bit. And we even had some, some caterpillar cam bearings that uh, we, we used on some 60 millimeter stuff that they were for the big, big race engines, and they were actually made out of a strap of metal, and they have a little zigzag in them at the top. They're not full round. And they're pretty good bearings, though, but they have a zigzag in them. And when you knock them in, that little place where the zigzag is, the, some of the babbit starts to fester out, and it's just, it, it's just enough makes the cam tight. And like, it doesn't, you know, the cam goes in, and it's real tight, and it's a big mess. So what we started doing, we made, for that, and then we made them for other things. This is a brooch. We call, it's a it's a brooch for cam bearings, and 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 what it is is the beginning and the end of it are about the size of the camshaft, and then in the middle, right here, this spot in the middle is discolored a little. It's three thousandths bigger than the cam, you know. And this is this is a steel one. This is bronze, but you can make them out of really about anything, but this is 3,000 bigger than the cam, cam side of the cam side. Okay, so you loop it up, drive it through, and it works perfect. It'll have, it'll, it'll take wherever the babbit's fat, stick it in, and just put it back like it used to be. And babbit's like lead, you know, so you can move it around. It's not a bad thing to do, you just put it back to where it used to be. So it'll normally get you out of the bind. If you need a little more clearance, what we found is, uh, one one cam station at a time, you warm it up a little. Take a benzomatic, get it where it's almost pretty hot, and it'll grow a thou. And all of a sudden, it's four thousand bigger. You drive that thing through, and it'll be uh, use oil on it. And you, you want to make sure where the where the big part stops and starts that you have a real nice radius and a ramp going up there. You don't want to edge.
but it'll uh, it'll save you so much trouble. These are more get you out of a buying tools. So you know you're putting an engine together, the heads are on it for good, everything's great. All of a sudden you got one push rod that's rubbing on a corner of an intake port somewhere, just somewhere. And you're setting the latch and it's kind of springy and you know what the problem is, you know. You can't turn the push rod. And so these are different kinds of reamers that we made to the center on the lifter, that's the push rod end. This is the push rod end, this is the whole push rod. You know, this is for a big engine, big push rod. But you just figure out a way to graft a, a reamer on it. This, these were actually core drills that we grafted onto them and then put some extensions. This is a core drill and it, you know, it's got a little put, it's welded into a push rod. It's probably even not perfectly straight. And then this was a reamer. You can see right here, that's a, that's a 5 8 reamer. You know, they used to have a table where we put it, where we could put it in a drill chuck, put it on a push rod, you put it down the block and you spin it. Even though the motor's together, what we do is we pack this with grease, okay? And you get down in there and you just give it a little bit. And usually it's not a parallel where it's cutting all up and down the whole thing. It's usually one corner or something. And you just ram it over a little bit and clean the grease out of the head. And a lot of times it'll make your life easier where you don't have to take special parts. This is a little tool that came to us uh, through uh, Sunset on Texas. And uh, what it is, it's just a wrist pin couple pieces of plastic on it, it's got a hardware store spring in it, and uh, it's just a spring-loaded wrist pin. The plastic is so that it doesn't scratch the bores, but what we use it for is, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one thing real quick. I've been doing this wrong for 50 years. I just found this a year ago. What we've been doing is we normally, this is all to grind for rod clearance down the bottom. We normally take a piston like this, cut the top off so we can see through it when you're when you're grinding on there because there's some places you can't see from the other side. You need to look down through this way. The problem with the piston going up and down is you start grinding on it, you got metal chips between the piston and the bore, and if it's all finished home, it doesn't do that home job any good, you know. So um, but Greg came to work here and he has this in so I said, what the heck you got? You know, so now we can still learn things here. But anyway, if you see that thing stays right in the middle of the board, it's it's a no-brainer, but I never thought of it. 50 years I've been doing it wrong. But uh, you can get down in there, you can look with a flashlight, you, you can leave it in there when you grind. The plastic doesn't eat the bore up. And it's, but the thing that's surprising to me is it really does a good job about staying right in the middle. And it took, this one really was a half hour at the most. You know, any kind of plastic, you can make it out of metal, put tape over it. I mean, it doesn't matter. But it's something you can make quick, make your life way easier when you're grinding the bottom for right things. And it won't, it, and you can have a finished home bore and it will not bother it in the least. This is a spanner wrench that we made. It's both Fords and Chevy, one end for each. But the reason for it, it goes all the way down and rests against the floor. And some of our, at least our Fords, we took the Fords to probably 200 foot pounds sometimes. Well, you almost break the engine stand off. If nothing else, the engine always wants to rotate. So if it goes against the floor, it doesn't really cause much trouble up here. And uh, we don't have to put a couple bolts in the flange and do all kinds of stupid stuff. So all it does is just plug it in the back. The Ford has four pins because they have an uneven bolt pattern. And uh, the Ford will do it, and it just, uh, these are turned down to about 350,000, so they'll slide in there and they're made out of brass if they want to threads. And then the Chevy end, you know, same thing, but the, since the Chevy is symmetrical, six. And then these holes here are where that dowel goes for the Chevy crank. So, you know, on the Chevy crank, you put it anywhere you want. And it goes to the floor. When you're tightening it, it will go on one side. When you loosen it, it goes on the other. It's just, uh, it's, a, it's an awesome tool. And, you know, we use it daily. Um, we're going to talk about a couple things here. One is this diamond wheel, and the other is a couple of machines we use it on. But this is the best one I've ever found for grinding uh, carbide tools, and we use it on the ring grind and everything else. So we'll talk about the MSC part number later. But it's a, they call it electroplate, but it's not like a vetrified uh, diamond wheel where they're kind of about an eighth inch thick. And 
we've had some stuff like that. We've had them on ring grinders before, but what happened is they end up getting grooves in them. You know, they wear them out. And then you're always searching for a new place and you can't face them. But this particular wheel, I've been using for five years on a grinder for sharpening tool bits, and it's still as good as the day I started. So um, they're, they're not cheap. I think they're a little under 200 bucks for the last of lifetime. But the reason I'm talking about it is there's millions of these things out there, and you don't know which one to get. So we have a part number of this, but what we also did was we used it on a couple of machines here, um, ring grinder. Now everybody here at our place hates grinding rings. And part of it is because the stuff we used to have, it would either dig a groove in it, or we, we put diamond wheels on them, but with a, with a vetrified type grid, it would, you know, put a groove in it and all of a sudden the end of the ring's not flat anymore, it's all curved and stuff is terrible. So uh, we, we took a wheel like this one I just showed you, we used it on here, but because it's so heavy, I did a little machining on it and lightened it up some, just because, mostly because it took so long to start up. But what we, so on this ring grinder, this used to be, uh, a whole little kit, it had a little tiny motor on it, it had like a zizz wheel or something. Okay, this little part here uh, came on that particular kit. So we kept this and everything else we made. This is a little flywheel blank, but this business part of this thing here is a $60 Home Depot bench crank. Okay, it's about, a, it's probably a quarter horse, it's not huge power, but it's plenty for this. And um, so we, we have the diamond wheel here. It's got years worth of room on it. It's 220 grit. You have to do a little bit of lathe work to make an adapter to put it on because, uh, you know, it's got a half inch shaft and these, these other wheels have a one inch hole in them and it needs a little bit of backing on it. So, you know, again, you have to do a little bit of lathe work. But when you get all done, you get that thing indicated in so it runs real good. We have a little scotch brake wheel on this end, and we do grow the rings on it after we grind them. But, but uh, this thing's just, it's just awesome. You, it, because the motor doesn't have a lot of power, it takes, it takes a few seconds to wind up, you know. But, but as far as grinding a ring goes, I mean, that little bit right there, I'm just touching it, but that's 30,000. Okay? So you can take all you want off with it. Now, the one thing is, that's really funny, the, the one thing is, my guys here, when they have a ring, they only have to take two or three thousandths off. I've seen them before, they'll be like this, then we turn it on, they just, that's one thousandth. So, it, you, it just works so good. We still hate grinding rings. But we don't hate grinding rings as bad as we did with a little grinder. So, it, it works great. But that's all with that, that diamond wheel like I showed you. And that thing will last a lifetime. It'll be around long after I'm done. This, this is the same wheel. It's just on a different machine. Uh, the same uh, diamond wheel. And uh, it'll last forever. We've been using them for years. But we just use this for grinding tool bits like this. For carbides. I also use it for drill bits and high-speed steel. It works, it works good for those. But... This is a one horse motor and it, it won't slow down. I mean, you can just really ram the car right into it. It works good. The, but as so long as I've been using this one, like I said, this is at least five years old. I use the whole thing, but it's no, there's no grooves in it. There's no pieces that's missing. It just stays on there and keeps cutting. What we're going to talk about is scotch brake wheels. And this is one of those deals. If something happened to this machine, I think everybody would go home for the day because it's just like, Everybody comes in here and uses it every five minutes. And I will tell you, this is a brand new one, and this is about a year old, so they last pretty good. Um, but we use it for everything, for deep burn stuff. Now, I'll show you some of the things we use it for. I'll show you the part number on this, because there's hundreds and hundreds of these. You'll never get the right one. You know, I've had stuff that we bought turned to dust in a day. You know, it just, this is the one. It comes from... 3M, and uh, we use, but like I said, about one a year we use, totally. But uh, we like to deburr, like on a lifter, sometimes if you look at the lifters, if they don't have a nice 45 on them, like this one right here, the very top edge, it, it's got, you can feel it, it's like a razor, and you don't really want that running up and down your 
iron block here, or aluminum. So we'll just do this. It won't hurt it. Like that, you know, it will get just enough of that off of there, and it won't hurt anything. You know, we basically sometimes we've had some that have a little nick or something right here, we just do the whole side, you know, works great. But then the big thing, and everybody hates cleaning titanium valves, it takes forever. You know, you, you, you scotch spray them, they put them in drill presses and that, but this will not hurt the seat, and we do these valves all the time in this.
we're not getting that guy admitted. We're going to have to make the hearing. Well, there's a way to do it that it'll come out really good. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. You know, of all the things we've probably talked about today, this is the most important of anything. Because this is something that really causes trouble, and most people do not know this. But these are our dyno headers. They're mild steel. Uh, they're coated on the outside, and they look pretty good. But what happens with a mild steel header is it rusts on the inside. So I'll show you. This has been sitting for about a week or two since we ran them last. But I'm going to tap them on the floor and see what comes out. How about that? You see all that there? Unbelievable, huh? Well, that's not a big deal, right? Well, yeah, it is. Because most people don't realize this. But when you crank your engine up, when it's idling, if it cranks up, it just chugs the life. All of a sudden it's running. Everything that's in that header goes all the way back in the engine, goes up and down with the rings, it goes up into the intake manifold. If it's got a carburetor on, it'll be on the underside of the throttle plates. Okay? A lot of people don't know this, but believe me, it happens. If you if you had a mild steel headers and you crank the motor up, just chug it to the light, turn it off. Take the carburetor off, you'll see rust in there. So what that does is it's going up and down with the rings and everything, and it scratches the bores up. You guys wonder, well, why? I clean this engine really good. Why are the bores scratched up when it comes, you know, when I took it apart? Well, a good bit of it is what happens when you first crank it up with mild steel headers. So there's one way you can maybe make things a little better if the headers have been on it and you've sat for two weeks. You give a little, before you crank it, you give a little fuel, hold the carburetor about half open, and when it cranks up, it immediately goes to like four or five thousand. You know, you think, oh, it's hard on the motor, and I don't care. You know, but what it cares about is rust going up and down with the rings. It does not like that at all, believe me. And, um, and you, you think, well, how does it get through here? How does it go back? Well, when you put a big camshaft in the motor, both valves are open at the same time. Manifold's got vacuum, it pulls it through. And um, we actually did a test when we had the infamous uh, finger in the port thing where we were doing some of those things. But we, we drilled a hole in a header down about here and down in the bottom. And we let we cranked one up and we let it idle. And we had a glass port that we could watch the intake port when it was running. It was one, you know, one runner was clear. We had a flashlight looking in it. We, we started an oil can down, we started squirting oil in the header. And after about five seconds, that oil was coming up the port, going up to the carburetors. You could see it in the, in the mist in there, the oil, every time it went doo -doo 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 -doo, like this. So that oil started out the bottom of the header, it went all the way through, went through the engine, went up to the end of the manifold, same as the rust would. Okay? So, um, a lot of times the, the assembler, the engine builder, the guy who owned the block, the people who make the pistons, they all get, they all get uh, blamed for these scratched up bores and stuff. I, I wanted to talk about this piston vise a second. I've seen all kinds of elaborate piston vices that uh, they all articulate and they're they cost the Lord knows how much thousands of dollars, but th this is a concept came from Sox and Martin from years ago, and uh, we just made one here. But it, it's a the jaws are plastic. They have wrist pins that go in. We have different sizes, but we every, about every quarter of an inch we change and put a bigger one in. But it grabs the piston by by the pin, and it just tightens it down. I've been using this stuff for 40 years, and uh, it just tightens it down like that, and we, we put it in here, put all the valve angles in the bridge port head. You can set the stop and you just come down like that, plunge cut it. And it's really the only way you can plunge cut if you ever want to put a tulip pocket in. But uh, the beauty of it is uh, you can do it fast. Um, we make some shims up like like this in case the bore size isn't quite right. Some of them are just 15,000 thick. But, uh, you know, in 40 years, we've never heard a piston skirt. It holds it real nice and tight, 
you know, where some of the other ones grab the pin and push it sideways. Well, the pin's not, it's way up high a lot of times up in the ring stack, you know, so it's kind of cocky. This, this thing is, this is almost impossible to beat this. We use this all the time. Um, I looked up and the problem is like a new Kurt vice like this is about 2000 bucks. It's an eight, it's an eight inch vice. Well, I looked up uh, MSC, they, they've got, I'm not going to say where it's made, but <laughs> they've got one that uh, it's, a, it's under 400 bucks. You know, but it has to be eight inch to work right. What I was going to show you is this is the way we would normally do a guide, like I was talking about when we make guides from blanks. Um, but the, the biggest thing is how you grip it. So what we do is we, took, we put a piece of metal in here. We make about a 10 degree angle cut on it. You can see that little point. And that's all it's going to, that's all it's going to drive that guide. You, you ram it on that point like that, put the live center on it. And it'll run perfectly through it, concentric. And it'll be enough friction to drive it, and you can do all your lathe work on it and stuff. But if you if you chucked it in the lathe, it's not going to be as good. It might be not. You might have some run out of it. You don't want that. Now, we also we bought these from Precision Products. It's a big blank that's already got the hole in it, part for the seal. It's like three quarter, and you can actually buy those from Precision and put them in like that and make those. Okay. Once again. You know, we don't really like waiting on stuff. So if you've got an emergency repair and you need to do sleeve work in it, most of the time you're not going to find what you want. So we'll get a big blank or something. We'll finish the outside ourselves. But the way to do that, you can't just grab a sleeve and turn it because it'll, it'll look like the chuck. It'll have three high and low spots. So we'll make a, a taper. There's a, there's a taper driver. It's about a 10 degree angle on that piece of aluminum. And uh, you just, that's enough to drive the sleeve. So you just put it in there. Put it in the live center, and uh, we can make our cut. Um, if we have to do some work on the flange, we might flip it around. But, but if you, we've made hundreds of sleeves this way, we're driving them just by that little taper. It'll stay around. It won't expand it really. And you know, we can we can make nice even cuts on it and. Uh, Sometimes it takes you a while to get your tool bit just perfect to get the finish like you want. But uh, it'll speed us up because we can't wait two weeks for a sleeve. So, uh, but that's that's the way we hold them, and we have really good luck with them. We're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our dyno mufflers. Um, you know, we've been through some steel ones, and a couple thousand bucks a piece sometimes, and about a year later they're all rusted and they're blowing up or whatever. But uh, we finally decided we made some out of cinder block. And uh, Clifford and son Jake, they built these uh, over a weekend. And what it is, it's a, each one, there's two of them, one over on the other side. Each one has about 200 bucks worth of cinder blocks. And uh, on the inside, there's a pipe from the exhaust comes out of the dining room, goes in the back. And where it comes out the front, you can see the two exits. But inside, there's some walls, you know, and some deflectors, but they're all hollow blocks. So they have passageways and there's no airflow problem whatsoever. Um, we put a steel top on it. It was a little bit loud. It had a little bit of a drum effect. So they put some weights on it and that, that calms it down. But, but those things are going to be here forever. You know, they're not going to rust out. They're not going anywhere. And we don't have almost any money. So uh, if you're building a dino room, if you, if you don't have mufflers or when it comes to replace them, and you can build them any way you want. I mean, you could make them a lot smaller and taller. You could do anything with the cinder blocks. And I will say that we ran them for a year or more without doing the mortar. We just had them placed there, you know, and there was nothing locking them down, and they didn't go anywhere. They didn't move. So you could do it temporary if you want to try things, but uh, it's one way to save a lot of money if you're doing dino room mufflers. I'm going to talk about some uh, connecting rods and fasteners for a minute, and uh, I'm hoping I get my facts straight. But, you know, on our big engines, those things at 8,500 RPM and five and three quarter stroke and the bob weight they have, they see about 21,000 pounds pulling this rod in half, trying to pull the cap off. So each each pull is seeing over 10,000 pounds of load. Well, when you're torquing this stuff. If the torque and the tension in the bolt isn't as much as it's going to see, it's going to stretch back and forth like this, and it'll rip the threads out of the rod or bend the bolt. Anyway, it'll fail. 
it'll flat fail. And you won't know what happened. It'll be a, a whole pan full of aluminum. So basically the bolt always has to be more clamping force than the rod's ever going to see. It's just like you wouldn't torque a cylinder head to 20 foot-pounds when you know it's going to see more than that going up and down. So um, as the motors have gotten bigger and more RPMs and stuff, the bolts and all that stuff in them has to be better and better. And it, but what it really has to be also is it has to be torqued more so that it sees more tension, more clamping force, so it, so it doesn't get overcome by the, the g-forces of the piston trying to stop when it goes up to the top and comes back down. But just a, that 8,500 five and three quarter stroke is um, about 21,000 pounds, but if you do nothing but change it to 7,500 RPM, it goes down about 5,000 pounds on the cab. Or if you take and you change the stroke one inch less, the four and three quarter, it's also about four or 5,000 pounds load if it loses. So we're pretty safe. These, a, a hundred foot pound bolt on some of these rods like this, they'll be about 16,000 pounds. Okay, at 100 foot pounds. But at 75 foot pounds, they're 10,000 something. 10,500 is the number we're going to see. So if you took a rod like this and torqued it to 75 foot pounds, it's going to blow up because it's not going to have the clamping force. But there's something else that happens that some of these people don't figure in with it. And that is that either the serrations on the rod on a new rod, after it rubs up a few times, it, it, it will sink in so it could lose some of the stretch on the bowl but because the cap actually comes down a little bit, maybe a thousandth. And if where the washer sits on the rod, if it doesn't have a big enough head, it'll burn out itself, it'll push itself in the aluminum, and all of a sudden that 100 foot pounds you had might only be 90 or 80. Then you're getting close to that point where it's going to start going like this and it's going to blow up and you won't know what happened because you you don't have anything to look at you know so you have to be really careful about the uh the torque and the, and the stretch and I, I will be honest with you like we like the arp stretch gauge they actually make one that's digital but that's way too high tech for me but i'll be honest we don't use it all the time you know but we we it's more, I think, maybe important on the steel rods, but the aluminum rods, they're almost, we torque them so much, they're almost overkill. But we do check them occasionally and make sure that where they're at. But what happens is 100 foot pounds is 16,000 pounds on the bolt, but 75 foot pounds is, I think, 11,000 uh, pounds. So 25 foot pounds makes a big difference. But about two thousandths of stretch is about the same as 20 foot pounds, what I found. So we have to kind of keep up with that and make sure, especially if, we're, if they've changed something. Or, but some of these, would you believe, like these are 100 foot pound bolts. 100 foot pounds, 7 16 bolt into aluminum. Okay, that's pretty good, right? These, these right here are 135 foot pounds. 135 foot pounds on a 7 16 spine bolt. In aluminum, you, you, I mean, guys worry about torquing a crank, flywheel below 100, <laughs> you know, so anyway, it, you have to keep up with that, but the, but the one thing is, if, if you don't have a clamping force as good as what it's going to see, it's going to blow up. So, we, anyway, we rely on this, we use the stretch gauges, we use them a lot on, on steel rods, especially because the torque doesn't always tell you what you need to know. The aluminum, it seems like it glides a little easier when the bolt goes in, like the friction is less, and the aluminum are pretty consistent on stretch versus how much you torque them. Steel rod, you can change the lubricant and it'll change how much the bolt stretches, and it needs to be right, so we need to check that to the stretch on them. Now, we talked about a bunch of these parts, but as promised, here's how you can get them. Uh, this is MSC, MSC Direct. Uh, most people that work on engines buy stuff from them. It's a good company. Um, this is Scotch Bright Wheel, but the important part is there's hundreds of these. The important part is that part number right there. That will get you what you need. Now, also with, McMaster, or with the MSC, 
if you have a salesman, you buy enough from them, you can ask them to get on their better plan and get a discount that's about 30%. It, uh, a lot of people are, are eligible for it and they just don't know it. Okay, the diamond wheel, there's a couple different ones we use, but these diamond wheels, those are the part numbers. The one we like for the ring grinder is the 220 grit, but if you're going to buy it for a regular tool grinder for carbides, it's so the 150. So, so that would be the 220 grit part number, and that's the part number for the uh, 150. Okay, also from MSC, this little jewel here. And um, but if you were trying to save money, you can find them on eBay, and they're about fifty bucks cheaper. Uh, but eight eight zero nine four five four five. And and then you know we buy a lot of materials and bolts and stuff from our Mastercard. Really good company. Big in Atlanta, the great thing if you live in Atlanta, both both companies have a huge warehouse here. We always get them the next morning. Um, but this is the bar stock, and this is what you need to look for. It's 630 bronze, C63000, and that's the part number right there from McMaster Car. Now they'll ask you for a length. Um, and it's about three feet of it, about 80 bucks or so. It's not cheap, but it's really it's really good stuff. It will never burn up and crack. It works for everybody uses it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Engine Performance Expo. Um, I'll be here live to answer any questions you have and um, about any of the things we just talked about, or it really doesn't matter. It could be about big engines or, or uh, offshore boats. We don't care. We can talk about anything you like. What a day, what a day, what a day. But yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars, we are not going to listen.